Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you for your warm welcome. What a crowd, what a turnout tonight. You know, recently I was introduced on the stage in New York as the man who'd made $100 million in real estate in Australia. And I got up on stage and I also said, thank you very much. It was very humbling. But I added, I feel I ought to set the record straight. Firstly, when you're in New York, it may seem as though Australia and New Zealand are connected by the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but they're really separate countries. It wasn't Australia, it was down in New Zealand. And secondly, if the truth be known, it wasn't in real estate, it was actually in the oil industry. And thirdly, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't a hundred million, it was only ten million. And anyway, it wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> and he didn't make ten million, he lost ten million. But apart from that, you've got the right person. You see, the whole point is things are never what they seem. We think we know the way something works or the way it's put together, but very often we are flat wrong. My belief is that real estate is not just a little bit better than other investments or even a lot better than other investments. It's hundreds and thousands of times better. But to convince you of that, you're going to have to change some of your paradigms. Remember what I said, things are never what they seem. One of my favorite statements goes like this. I know it's a bit provocative, but... And there it is. Woman without her man is helpless. And I put that up there for a specific reason. The point is that things are never what they seem. If I ask you, what do McDonald's do? You all know that they make hamburgers, right? And it's true, they do make hamburgers. But making hamburgers is incidental to McDonald's operations. What McDonald's do is very clever. They go around the world and always buy up pieces of land on the left-hand side of the road leaving town for those countries that drive on the left, and on the right-hand side of the road leaving town for those countries that drive on the right. The reason why they do that is when you're driving home from work after a hard day at the office, and you suddenly remember you haven't bought any groceries, what on earth are you going to do for dinner? You can see the McDonald's sign and say, oh, I'll just pull off the road and buy takeaways rather than having to cross the peak hour traffic. So they buy pieces of land on that side of the road, they pull down whatever's there, they put up a fancy glass structure, slap the big yellow M on it, and then they do three very clever things. Firstly, it's true that they sign up their franchisees for a high upfront fee. That's smart on McDonald's part. And secondly, it's true they have a contract such that every hamburger sold results in a commission coming back to McDonald's. Also very smart. But thirdly, and most importantly, McDonald's signs its tenants up on long-term leases. McDonald's owns just about every property that they operate out of. McDonald's is the world's biggest and swishest real estate company. You've all had a chance to read this. Could I have a show of hands, please? How many of you agree with the statement? And you're brave enough to admit it. <laughs> all right, well, you came without your spouse, and you didn't, you arrived in the right, all right, thank you. How many of you disagree with it? Oh, folks, we've got a turnout that is hopeless. We, we've got to backtrack here for a moment. What is the opposite of love? Hate, you all say. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. It's where you're indifferent about something. The worst thing you can ever be called is a nice person. Because the word nice is an acronym for nothing inside me cares enough about you to have an opinion. You're nice. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you want to be successful as a real estate investor or as anything else, you can't be indifferent. You've got to have an opinion. If you don't have an opinion, how will you make a decision? If you don't have an opinion as to whether it's a good deal, you'll never buy it. You're allowed to have an opinion. It doesn't matter if your opinion clashes with that of the person sitting next to you. Have an opinion. Be willing to make mistakes. The people who never make mistakes never learn. Those who make mistakes often learn very fast. So having said all of that, could I please have a show of hands? How many agree with the statement, woman without a man is helpless? Thank you, that's quite a good turnout. And now, how many disagree with it? All right, thank you, that's most of you. Well, that's very interesting to see. What I want to do now is take this pen again and just put a couple of marks on this paper. I'm going to put a comma down here. And I'm going to put a colon here, actually. And how about a comma here?
Those of you who don't get it yet, ask someone discreetly in the break. <laughs> Can you see how by adding three little marks to this piece of paper, we have completely changed the meaning of it? How many of you now agree with the statement? Oh, look at that. Have I redeemed myself, madam? <laughs> Thank you. And how many now disagree with it? Oh, some of you. Okay, interesting. The point I'm making here is we had a statement about which most of you had an opinion. And then by putting three little dots on the paper, we suddenly completely changed the meaning of that sentence. And life can be like that. Things are never what they seem. Sometimes by changing a little aspect, your paradigms are shifted. What I want to do tonight is show you by adding three metaphorical little dots to your perception about real estate, suddenly we might change it from being a lousy investment to being, wow, I never realized it was that good. That's pretty hot. Who would like to go on that journey? Okay, let's do it. I came from a family that prized education. Their belief system was to do well in life, you need to study hard. Because by studying hard, you can get qualifications and a degree. And with a degree, you can get a good job. And with a good job, you can build a career. And with a career, you can have financial security. Was that bad advice on the part of my parents? Well, it wasn't for them, right? They did to the best of their abilities. They tried to give us the tools we needed. It's the sort of education that they would have wanted to have. So from their perspective, it was great advice. So it was without much thinking that I went off to university. Didn't know what I wanted to study. You know, I didn't like the sight of blood, still don't really. That was medicine out. The thought of peering into people's mouths all day, I mean, yuck. That's dentistry out. Um, I wanted to do law, but then you have to practice in the country in which you study, so I eliminated that. I went through this process of elimination and ended up doing engineering. However, during my first week at engineering school, I looked around me at these academics who were supposed to have made it, and they wore shabby clothes and drove around in old clunkers and lived in very modest homes. And I thought, there's something wrong with my picture that academics have financial security. So I took it upon myself at the tender age of 17 to make a study of the rich. I wanted to know what is it that the rich have in common because I thought if I could identify 30 or 40 things that they have in common, and if furthermore I could emulate those things, then my chances of becoming fabulously wealthy surely would go up. Would you agree? Good theory. It didn't work, though. Because at the end of this nine-month study, I concluded that the rich had very little in common. It wasn't age or gender or whether you were born into a rich family or not, or whether you were an immigrant family, whether you were the firstborn, the lastborn. It had nothing to do with any of those things. I could only find two things that the rich had in common. The first is that almost without exception, the rich had, they had integrity. In other words, their word was their honor. If they said they were going to do something, they did it. Now here's a secret I learned about integrity long after my nine month study at the age of 17. Integrity is not genetic. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you don't like the level of integrity that you've got, you can change it in a heartbeat. Just make the commitment to be more true to your word. And I'm telling you, your financial future will change. The second thing that the rich had in common, almost without exception, is that they either made their money or they held their wealth in property. In other words, the Hughes Corporation, they made their money because they had a patent on a diamond-tipped drilling bit. That's how they made their billions of dollars. But they didn't just hold it in stocks of diamond-tipped drilling bits. They bought real estate with it. So the rich either made their money or held their wealth in real estate. That's why I decided at 17, that's what I want to get into. Now, it wasn't easy as a 17-year-old kid going to a bank and asking for a mortgage. If you think I look young now, you should have seen me then. They, they thought I was 12. The first bank manager thought it was a prank. If you think that's tough, imagine what it was like for me as a 17-year-old kid asking a 17-year-old girl out on a date, and she too would think I was 12. Well, you may well laugh. I got to date the 17-year-olds for years afterwards. <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, it was tough getting my first mortgage. But I succeeded. I got my first property. And then as time went on, I bought more and more properties. It took four years to get an honors bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, not the easiest course around. They came to me and said, you know, it's only one more year for a master's. Why don't you do it? And I couldn't think of an answer. So I did it. 
And then I switched to PhD, and I ended up spending eight years at university. They say there are three kinds of students, part-time, full-time, and eternal. I was the eternal variety. But at the end of those eight years, I popped out with a little piece of paper that said PhD. Now think of my parents. Remember the ones with the philosophy that you have to study hard to do well. Do you think they were proud of their son? Oh, can you imagine? They were sitting by the telephone waiting for me to phone them to announce the acceptance of a job. And I had a couple of interviews. I remember going to one interview where they seemed impressed. They said, well, we want to take you on. We'll offer you a salary of $32,000. Now, before you scoff at that, back then, $32,000 was a handsome salary. And it would have been tempting. However, unfortunately for my prospective employer, I'd just completed a real estate deal that netted me $35,000. And I remember thinking to myself, why would anyone in their right mind work for 40 hours a week for 50 weeks of the year, turning up every morning at 8 or 9 o'clock saying, hi boss, here I am, what would you like me to do today, for $32 lousy thousand dollars, when in one week you can make 35 and take the rest of the year off. So I never accepted that job, and to this day, I have never had a job. You see, we're stuck in this trap thinking that we need to do what's not successful for us because there's no alternative. And I want to show you that there is an alternative. I was cajoled into writing a book. This first book here came out, Making Money in Residential Real Estate, co-authored with an Australian. It came out 10 years ago this year, and it's significant because in this book we describe a 10-year plan where if you buy one property a year for 10 years, you can end up with an equity of $1 million. Of course, in Sydney, an equity of $1 million doesn't mean much, but anyway. <laughs> so um, we came up with this book. It's just a very easy read, 76 pages. People have achieved this, this uh, $1 million of equity long before their 10 years was up simply by buying more than one property a year. I was cajoled into sharing more details about what I do and how I do it. And eventually I thought, well, this is all very good and well, but I better check my audiences to see whether anyone's taking the information on board and earning a million or two for themselves. Fair enough? And to my absolute horror, the percentage of people just like yourselves who would actually apply the knowledge I was giving them and go out there and make a million bucks was very small, about 5%. And I was devastated. I thought, gee. Am I not speaking clearly enough? <laughs> Am I speaking too fast or too slow? It bugged me. So I embarked on my second big study. The first one <laughs> wasn't the PhD, remember, it was what makes the rich rich. And the second study was why is it that when you give people money or give them ideas, they don't act on it? Well, this study took a lot longer. This was an 11 month study. It really bugged me. I was racking my brain, I was doing all my research, and I came up with the answer. And the answer is embedded in a program I run, which takes a long time, way longer than we've got time for tonight. However, I can do an exercise in three minutes flat, which gets the same information as it would if we spent two days doing this. So I want your permission to go through this exercise. Before I ask you whether you agree or not, I warn you, though, it involves something that you all think you like, but deep down you may despise. It involves cold, hard cash. Having said that, who would like to go through the three-minute exercise? All right, most of you, good. I always believe that carrying money around on one's person is a very good idea. I think you should always have a lot of money, US dollars if you travel around a bit, Australian dollars. Could you confirm that this is a real Australian dollar note? We're not talking monopoly money or anything like that. I'm going to do an exercise here. If you've seen this or heard it or heard of it, please sit back, relax, enjoy the show, get another level of learning out of it. I'm going to say something, and I want you all to act on what I say. I have here a $100 note from the Reserve Bank of Australia. Who will give me $50 for it? <laughs> you sure? Are you give to yes, I <laughs> Is this a real note? <laughs> Seems to be, all right. What's your first name? David. David. Congratulations, David. Let's give him a big hand. So David gave me a $50 note. I gave him $100. Is it fair to say that David just made $50? Let's give him another round of applause. Well done. <laughs> 
So similarly, is it fair to say that I just lost $50? <laughs> You're all saying, what a fool. <laughs> but do it again, I'll know direct from this time. Did I lose $50 though? There are over 800 people in this room. Could it be that I'm willing to invest $50 in a room of 800 people, it's just cents per person, so that you can learn in three minutes flat, remember, what otherwise would have taken me a whole weekend? Is my time worth more than $50 for a weekend? You better believe it. Who couldn't have done the deal because you didn't have $50 on your person? Raise your hands up high, please, and look around. You're not at the people, but at the number of hands up in the air. So thank you for being honest. But for whoever said, well, I don't need money because, you know, what would I need it for? Here is a prime example. You can do great deals, and real estate is like that, as we'll find it in a minute. Where's the plastic brigade? When I said, who will give me $50 for it, did I say in cash? Would I have accepted a credit card? Did anyone ask me? You bet, would I have accepted an IOU? Absolutely, just to teach the rest of you a lesson. <laughs> can you buy real estate with an IOU? Of course you can, it's called a mortgage. It's not funny, it's true. <laughs> All right, why else didn't you come up? Tell me. Too good to be true. Who thought it was too good to be true? Well, thank you very much. After I go to all this effort to talk about integrity, you think I'd go up there and say, who would give me $50 for this thing? Just as you come up, I say, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> thank you very much for your faith and confidence. Just because a deal sounds too good to be true doesn't mean to say that it is. It may be. Check it out. But if you don't check out deals that sound great, by definition you will be limiting yourself to those deals that are so lousy, those deals where the returns are so low, they're bound to be real. And I hope you will realize that this exercise has absolutely nothing to do with a lousy $50 inside this room tonight. It has everything to do with $50, 50000 5 million, 50 million outside of this room tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Because in all probability, the way you reacted to this exercise is the way you react to real deals in real life. I don't have the money. I don't need it anyway. It's probably a prank. Sounds too good to be true. They wouldn't take an IOU. Not even worth asking. Oh, someone else has got the deal. Look, there's someone fluffing around at that wherever it is. I want you to think about that. What's holding you back? What stops you from going out there and doing those deals? And it all has to do with belief systems. This is what my study showed me, that we're all brought up believing certain things. You go to one of your parents and say, hey, mom or dad, I want a bicycle. And they say, well, what do you think, kiddo? That money grows on trees. We've all heard that, right? Or we're told money is the root of all evil. In, other words, in fact, the actual saying was, for the love of money is the root of all evil. But we all think money is associated with being evil. We're told that in order to make money, you must have money. Hey, that's my excuse. I don't have any money. I can't make any. I'm poor. I was born this way. I'll probably die this way. So don't give me a hard time about it. The more you say that, the more it becomes a part of you. Even when we describe the rich, do we call them squeaky clean rich? No, we talk about them as the filthy rich. They are so rich, they are stinking rich. We associate being wealthy with filth and stench. So one exercise you may want to do, most of you won't, is tomorrow morning go to the bank and withdraw $1,000. Those of you that don't have $1,000 in the bank, you've got a problem. <laughs> Withdraw $1,000 and carry it around on your person for an entire month. Because assuming that you won't be mugged, and I'm not guaranteeing that you won't, so don't blame me if you are. <laughs> assuming you're not mugged, assuming it's not stolen, assuming you don't lose it, and assuming you don't spend it frivolously, at the end of that month, you will still have that 1000 in your pocket. And you'll say, wow, you know what? I've overcome all those fears. I'm in control of this money and something will happen inside of you. 
suddenly you will be in control of this thing that you've been frightened of. If you couple that with coming up with some new belief systems instead of money is the root of all evil or only my rich neighbors can afford stuff because they're doing illegal things, say, hey, money comes to me easily. Or become more evangelical about it. I am a magnet for money. <laughs> Anything. And say that out loud if you think your spouse will not kick you out for saying it every morning and every evening. And say it when you get up and when you go to sleep. And do that for a month and carry your thousand dollars around on, on your person. Your lives will change. Give it a go. What have you got to lose? <laughs> you guys are so pragmatic, you know. <laughs> Maybe I should say, what have you got to gain? Everything, exactly. So give it a go. All right, I want to talk about real estate because that's my passion. I love real estate. As I said, I don't think it's a little bit better or a lot better. I think it's orders of magnitude better. So the book I wrote most recently is called Real Estate Riches. And if you don't mind, could I have a show of hands? How many have read this book? Just, okay, that's a good turnout. Thank you very much. Um, it's also good to know we've still got new clients out there. That's fabulous. Um, but I want to summarize four questions I pose in this book because they're at the core level of what I believe in. Let's imagine we want to compare investing in real estate with investing in other things. Now, other things for most Australians means the stock market, the share market. You can also invest in mutual funds or unit trusts or other, it's still shares. Mostly Australians invest in shares. So I want to compare real estate with shares. Imagine also we have a lump of money. It'll be hard for some of you to imagine you have no money, but anyway, um, you will have by the time you invoke some of the things we're learning here. Imagine you've got $100,000 in cash. Could be more, it could be less, doesn't matter. I'm going to ask four questions. First question goes as follows. You're going to use your 100,000 cash to invest in shares. How many dollars worth of shares can you buy with 100,000 cash? 100,000, right? I know some will say, but hang on, you can buy shares on margin. And that's true for a small number of investors, for a small number of shares, usually a small percentage of what's on the market, and then only have about 30% of the value. And if the shares go down a little bit, they have what's called a margin call. For most Australians, when you invest $100,000 in the share market, you have to put up 100,000 cash. Let's compare that with real estate. You have that same 100,000 cash. You want to buy real estate. How many dollars worth of real estate can you buy with 100,000 cash? A million easily, right? That means you need a 90% mortgage on $900,000. Now, I know some of you think, well, hang on a minute. 900,000, even at 5%, that's 45,000 a year. That's more than I earn. How am I going to pay it? And the answer is, you will have an asset worth $1 million that's generating rental income. If you buy well, that will more than cover your mortgage interest. So that's question number one. Question number two goes as follows. You've spent your $100,000 cash buying $100,000 worth of shares. The moment you bought them, what were those shares worth? 100 grand, right? Because by definition, there is only one price at which willing buyers and willing sellers are allowed to transact. The share market is very efficient. Whether you're buying in Tasmania or up in the Gulf of Carpentaria somewhere, or Darwin or Perth, you pay the same price. So you bought exactly $100,000 worth of shares. Let's compare that with real estate. The day you bought your property for a million dollars using 100,000 cash and a $900,000 mortgage, what was that property worth? A million. Is it possible that it was worth a million? Sure it is. However, is it not also possible that some fast-talking real estate agent or seller talked you into paying a million bucks for a property that's only worth 640000 Is that possible? Sure it is. Does it happen? You better believe it. By the same token, is it not also possible that you just bought a property for a million dollars that when you get a valuation report on it, it's worth one and a half million? Is that possible? Does that happen? Every day of the week, folks. The question you might want to ask is, why would anyone in their right mind sell a property for a million dollars when it's worth one and a half million? Does anyone want to know the answer to that? Oh, you do? Okay. There are 101 reasons, folks. Every reason is unique. Every property that I've bought at below its true value has had a different reason as to why people have sold it for below its true value. Very often, it's because the sellers are too stingy to engage the services of a valuer. They think, oh, I know what the value is. Look, the house next door sold for 460 and the one up the road sold for 480 So if I get 520 for mine, I'm doing really well, aren't I? When in actual fact, any of a dozen valuers would have put a value of 595000 on that property. It's the only one with a few, for heaven's sake. It's got a triple garage. 
right? So being too stingy is a very common reason. Uh, a property might be bequeathed to four kids. One wants to live in it, the second one wants to rent it out, the third one wants to turn it into a commune, the fourth one's hiking somewhere. They have a big row, they just say, let's sell the pro property fast and split the proceeds. Or what very often happens, especially here in Australia, is people find their dream home. They sign up to buy it. They say, let's have settlement in two or three months. Plenty of time to sell our existing home. And then, of course, time goes by and suddenly they say, whoops, only 10 days before we have to settle and we haven't sold our home. What happens to the price? It comes down. Or someone bought a property back in 1962 for 1,500 pounds and they think they're ripping you off by getting half a million for it when it's worth 700,000. The reasons are many and varied. Uh, the property I just bought in Phoenix, we bought it from a couple who unfortunately were divorcing. Not only were they divorcing, they had restraining orders out on each other, which means that by law they weren't allowed to be in the same place at the same time. They couldn't negotiate their side very well. <laughs> right, so you'll find 101 reasons why people sell real estate at below its true value. I love that. You can find a bargain every day of the week. All right, that brings us to question number three. You've spent 100,000 cash on shares. The moment you bought them, they were worth exactly $100,000. What can you personally do to massively increase the value of those shares? Not much. Well, come on, let's be creative. Could you hope? <laughs> Could you pray? Could you not write letters to the directors of these companies wishing them a good day? Could you perhaps go out and buy as many of the products and services as these companies make so that you boost their turnover and therefore their share value? Your options are limited, would you agree? Okay. The moment you buy your one and a half million dollar property for a purchase price of only a million dollars using a hundred thousand cash and a nine hundred thousand mortgage, what can you do to massively increase the value of that property? Painted, who said that? <laughs> who said that? No one wants to admit to it. Well, someone did. You didn't say it, but of course you can paint it. Look, painting it singularly is probably the simplest thing you can do to massively increase it. I once bought a cottage for $60,000 on a Thursday. Now, it was pretty dilapidated. There was so little paint on the weatherboards that there was more wood exposed than paint. No one wanted it. It had been on the market for three months. I know exactly what other potential buyers would have thought. Look at that old dunger of a property. Paint's in bad condition. I bet the roof leaks too, which means it's gone. The water's gone down to the floorboards. They'll be warped and rotten. The piles will be rotten. I bet the plumbing needs redoing and the wiring will be shot. Who'd want it? 60 grand. They've got to be kidding. So along I came, I bought it, I spent $400 painting it. Now, if you're really cheap, you could get away with only painting the front. <laughs> You'd have an integrity issue. So paint the whole thing, $400. I sold it the following Tuesday for $80,000. Now, I call that a $20,000 weekend. Who likes the sound of a $20,000 weekend? Okay, absolutely you can paint the property. What else could you do to it to increase the value? Landscape, absolutely. You could put in a flower bed. You could put up a new nice white picket fence or paint one that's there already. Perhaps change the letterbox. There are, again, 101 things you can do to massively increase the value of a property without spending much money. Who'd like a list of 101 things you can do? All right, well, that was the book I finished two weekends ago now. It's literally called that. 101 things you can do to massively increase the value of a property without spending much money. We've got wacky ideas. Just shampooing the carpets might do it, or perhaps replace the carpets. You don't have to buy new ones, you can get great second-hand carpet or end-of-run carpet. Or maybe lift the carpet and see what wood is underneath. If it's nice wood, get a commercial sander in to sand it, polyurethane it, and you've got a beautiful wooden floor. Change the doorknob. Sometimes just putting brighter light bulbs in the house will do it, because it looks bigger and roomier. Right? If you've got a really expensive home here in Sydney, or one of those $2 million plus homes, would you like to know how you can spend $200 on concrete to increase the value by twenty dollars or $30,000? No? All right, then I'll move on. <laughs> Look, all you do is you pour the concrete in the middle of your rambling front yard somewhere, and you get a paintbrush out, and you paint a white H on it with a circle around it. <laughs> and then the society magazines will be able to say, oh, the so-and-sos have a helipad. <laughs> Look, you're limited by your imagination. There are so many things you can do to massively increase the value. My favorite example is the carport. And it goes like this. Imagine you have a rental property, two, three, four bedrooms, doesn't matter. It doesn't have a garage or a carport.
do you think that your tenants would prefer it if there were a carport there? Of course. Would they be willing to spend more money to have a carport? Yes. $20 a week, is that an exaggeration? Is that too much? You'd easily get an extra $20 a week rent. Now ask yourself, how much would it cost to build such a carport? A carport is just four poles and then a roof with a slope on it. Again, if you're really cheap, you could probably get away with three poles. <laughs> it would look odd, but you'd get away with it. So four poles. I maintain you can build a carport for $1,000 easily. You get $20 a week extra in rent. Over the course of a year, that's $1,000, right? With which other investment that you can name can you spend an extra $1,000 on it and then get $1,000 a year forever coming back? Index for inflation. That's a 100% return. That's pretty good. As they say in the infomercials, but wait, it gets better. <laughs> Imagine you didn't pay for the carport yet. Right? It's cost $1,000. You bring the valuer back in and say, look, I'm getting 1000 extra a year in rent. What's the value gone up by? He's likely to cap that rent out. We won't go into cap rates here, but he'll cap it out by around 10%. He'll say it's gone up by about $10,000. You go back to the bank and borrow a modest 70% of that, you'll get $7,000 from the bank. Now, you have to pay mortgage interest on it, which even at a generous 10% would just be $700 a year. You're collecting $1,700 in mortgage interest. That means you've still got $300 a year index for inflation for the rest of your life. You use 1,000 of that 7,000 to pay for the carport. It's paid for, correct? That leaves $6,000 in your pocket. Now ask yourself, is that $6,000 income? It's not, is it? So there's no income tax owing on it. Is it a capital gain? No, no capital gains tax. Is it the sale of something? No sales tax. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no tax obligations on that lump of money that you've just put in your pocket. And if you think, well, who would do it for a mere, you know, a mere um, $6,000? What if you had 20 homes like that and you put up 20 carports? Would 120,000 cash with no tax obligations legally, would that appeal? At what point would you say, yeah, I think I could do this? You see, you are limited by your imagination. And the difference is, and I want to come back to this first statement I put up here, where some of you saw it and thought, huh. You didn't even think of figuring out a different way. When other people go looking at real estate here in Sydney and they see a house without a garage or a carport, they say, God, who'd want that? It'd be hard to find a tenant for. And they move on. And I get driven by by a real estate agent who doesn't have a garage or a carport. I have difficulty containing my excitement. <laughs> I can see $6,000 on the footpath <laughs> waiting for me to say, hey, stop here just to pick it up. The thing about this whole game is it's simple. It is so incredibly simple. It just defies reasoning as to why more people don't do it. Part of my mission is to share my views on why it's so easy so that you can do it. I know one of the reasons why people get put off is firstly the media. The media tends to be against real estate. And the financial planning industry is against it. That's why you'll get funny reports, often from financial planners or consultants or people in other industries who will say things, well, hang on a minute. In Australia, property only went up by 6% last year on average, whereas the shares went up by 7%. Why would you be bothered with property for a lower return and all the management houses when you can get a higher return from shares? Is that a pretty good argument on the surface? Pretty compelling, isn't it? But you now know some of the anomalies with this argument. In fact, it's patently ridiculous. Because as we've said, when you buy shares, you put up all the money. When you buy real estate, you only put up a small fraction of it. So you've got leverage. So let's explore that. I want to talk about the yield that you get on most cash investments. So yield, by definition, it equals the return that you get, or the money coming out, divided by the investment. So let's put some numbers to it. Let's say we have the same $100,000 cash and we want to put that in the bank. So our investment is $100,000. And the income we're earning from it is $6,000 per annum. Very reasonable, right? You get a return on it at $6,000 per annum. The investment's $100,000. What's your yield? What's the percentage return? 6%, right? It's not rocket science. 
I know for the purists amongst you, it will change a bit depending on whether you're paid weekly or monthly or quarterly or annually, and whether the interest is paid in arrears or in advance. But in general, the return will be around 6%, and that 6% is an accurate reflection of how your investment is working. Now, when we compare that with real estate, it's a bit tricky, because the yield on a piece of real estate, by definition, equals the rental income divided by the purchase price. Nothing wrong with that, the rental income divided by the purchase price. So let's talk in terms of a property that we bought for $100,000, and our rental income is $6,000. Again, what is the yield on this property? 6%, right? Do you all agree with that? 6%, it's simple. That is the yield by definition. However, it is no longer an accurate reflection of how this investment is working for the simple reason that the purchase price may have been $100,000, but have you necessarily put in $100,000? The answer is no. You might have only put up 10% as a deposit and the rest was borrowed. So if you in fact put up $10,000 and you've still got $6,000 coming out, then you've got $6,000 over $10,000, which is 60%. Big difference, right? But hang on a minute. We now have a mortgage of $90,000 and we're paying interest on that, say at 5%, $90,000 would be $4,500. So our returns are now only $1,500 divided by the $10,000 which is 15%. Still a lot better than the share market at seven, but it's different from what we started off with. In addition to the mortgage interest, we've got maintenance issues, um, rates, insurance, pest control, letting fees, management fees, all those other expenses that degrade your income and will give you a worse yield. On the other hand, there is also one aspect to real estate that you get which increases your income. Does anyone know what it is? Depreciation. It's often called a phantom income. You can legally depreciate the property even if it goes up in value for taxation purposes. The effect of that is effectively that the government gives you some money. They're encouraging you to invest in real estate. We'll explore that a bit later on. What I'm getting at is that whereas it's very easy to work out the yield on a cash investment, it is very difficult to work out the true return on a piece of real estate. That's why working it out on a piece of paper is not very wise. And what we do is we revert to a computer analysis. And I want to go through that with you here. We have a program called REAP, Real Estate Acquisition Program, where you can put in all those pertinent details of the property and then figure out whether or not it's a good deal. One of my golden rules is I think you should look at 100 pieces of real estate in order to find 10 that you might want to put offers in on, in order that you might get three offers accepted that you then have to finance so that you can buy one. It is a numbers game, all right? And how are you going to look at 100 pieces of real estate if you don't have an efficient way of analyzing them? So what I'd like to do is go to the screen here and show you how we can easily enter this data. Firstly, when we start the program, we've got three big icons up on the screen. The first one here is a map of the world where we set up the locations and the parameters for that location. So you can do this in various countries, the USA, Australia pops up here, for instance. This is where we put in things like the tax scales that are in, in use. Right, so once you've set up your country, you then go to the screen where we input data on a property. Now here we get to a very interesting point, because I can give you examples of properties I've bought, and you're going to yawn and say, yeah, no wonder. I bet all the agents around town give them their best deals, even if it's just so that they can say, hey, we sold a property to Dolph. Well, it doesn't work that way but my deals are pretty good. If I analyze one of mine, you're likely to say, no wonder, that's a Darus deal. So is there anyone here who has just bought a property, or perhaps more interestingly, you're about to close on one or settle on one, and you want to know whether it's a good deal, and before you volunteer, I've got to tell you. We once did this for a large real estate firm, and their second in command said, yeah, I've just bought one, and we analyzed it, and it turned out to be a dog. <laughs> so you've got to be willing to, to fail in this one. Is there anyone who's just bought a property? and you know all the numbers on it? You know the rates and the insurance and all that sort of thing? You do, you're not so sure? You do, sir? Okay, what's your first name? Tom. Tom, thanks Tom for volunteering for this. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load a new property and we're going to call it Tom's Pad. <laughs> and here we go, we set everything to zero. The first thing we have to do is set it up for Australia. I presume it is in Australia, Tom. 
We won't put the address details in. Have you bought it already or are you about to buy it? It's happened today. How exciting, all right. Well, here we go. First question is, <laughs> well, it is. He can't go back now, you know. It is what it is. <laughs> so, Tom, do you mind sharing? What did you pay for it? 99000 99, <laughs> Have you had a valuer in to value it? And what did he say? All right, let's put in 132, if you don't mind. We can see later what would happen if we made it 140. So we've got 132. The conveyancing costs, the costs of putting in your, your name. Oh, you do know the numbers, okay. $1,132, done. If there are any other costs that come to mind once we've gone through, remember to sing out about them. We've <laughs> you do know the numbers. <laughs> All right. Um, I hazard a guess that you'll know what the property, or what is it called, the rates are? Yes, the rates are $798 a year. 798 Okay, great. Now, we said before that we can depreciate the building. Notice we said the building, you cannot depreciate land. So to work out how much we can depreciate, we have to know either of the purchase price, how much is represented by land and how much is represented by building, or you get that from your rates demand. We're estimating here, unless Tom and I suspect you may know, but unless you know better, that 75% of the purchase price is building and 25% roughly is land. That's is that about right? Yeah, it tends to be right. roughly right for single dwellings in Australia. The initial cash investment, how much cash are you envisioning putting into this property? Uh, the deposit was 10000 uh -huh. and I uh, am going to put in about another 7000 for the renovation costs. All right, so let's put in $17,000 in total. Um, the next slot is for taxable income. I won't ask you that, Tom, but the program needs to know what your taxable income is so that when you have some depreciation items, you get the rebate, if you like, at your appropriate marginal tax rate. So if you put in your exact income there, the software will deduct every depreciable dollar at the appropriate rate. Let's just put in a figure, say, of 60000 just a sort of median number in Australia. And uh, when you do it for yourself, you can tweak that, of course. Now, we said there'll be no managers, so there are no management fees. Is uh, I've got a real estate manager. They charge 8%. All right, so we can put in the percentage here, 8%. All right, we're nearly there. We now come to the loan. Um, the loan has to be for all the costs, less, you know, your deposit, obviously. What sort of a loan did you get on it, Tom? Interest only. For how many years? Five years matter. initially. All right, and the interest rate? Uh, 5.73. Is that reasonable, folks? Yep, it is, isn't it? And then any costs associated with getting the loan? Yes, there were. How much was that? Uh, $1,300. Wow. All right, and any establishment fee for the loan? Often it's 1% or half yes, a percent? Yes, there was, yes. How much was it, do you know? Uh, about 1.5%. Wow, that's a lot too. Okay, 1.5%, there it is. Mortgage insurance? Uh, yes, that was about uh, $1,300. Right. So here we've got all our costs for the loan. So far, it's just under $4,000. That's quite huge. And this is where we said renovations. We had $7,000 worth of renovations, right? So now the final thing we need is the rent per week. 300 300 Is that real? Yeah, it's got a um, two-bedroom flat at the back of the house. Ah, oh, so it's a home plus income. Yep. Very smart. Who would have thought that for $99,000 you could buy two sources of income? Do these deals exist? Of course they do. Tom's just showing you how to do one. Okay, we're now in a position where we can start looking at all our assumptions. And to do that, we go to our reports. Tom's putting in $17,000. In the first year, he pulls out $7,100, then $5,100, $5,300, $5,400, $5,600. And at the end of five years, his equity has gone to $80,000. To do that, a bank would have to offer you over five years 82% return on your money. And this is not a fudge factor, folks. This is real. This is the way it is in reality. This is why real estate is so good. Now, I know that's a lot of numbers, so let's look at the graphs. And here we go. The first graph goes like this. Who pays the interest bill? And we can see that in this case, the tenant pays 100% of it. He pays all of it. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? You're not contributing to that interest at all. We go down to the next one. Um, property cash flows. Let's have a look at that. $17,000 going in. Look at this. The, both pre and after tax, yellow and blue, we're into huge positive cash flow. Looks like a great deal. 
And the one that interests me most is this one here, property versus cash. Imagine if Tom put a $17,000 in the bank. How much could he earn on it? Come on, some of you must have money in the bank. Four and a half. So would you agree that 6% is generous? All right, let's put in 6%. We're going to compare Tom's $17,000 in the bank growing at 6% versus the same $17,000 in this property growing at only 5%. Are you ready? Here we go. Here is $17,000 in the bank growing at a whopping 6% versus $17,000 in Tom's property growing at only 5%. By the way, this graph, better than any words I can use, describes why I am in real estate. That sums it up. If you don't understand anything I'm saying, just remember that graph. How is it possible that something growing at 6% has almost negligible, negligible growth, whereas something else growing at only 5% can beat the pants off it? Why is that? Leverage. That's right. It's because the 6% growth is on the 17,000 cash input. The 5% growth on the real estate is not on the $17,000 cash components. It's not even on the $99,000 purchase price component. It's on the $102,000 market value component. It's 5% of 132000 in the first year alone. Now, before we go any further, ask yourself this question. Can you think of any other investment scenario where you can earn income, pay all your expenses, and then you end up with your net pre-tax income? You pay tax on it, and you end up with more than you did before you paid tax. Do you see what I'm saying? With any other business, if you earn $5,000 after all your expenses, you expect to pay tax on it, right? Well, here you've got a way where you earn income, and you don't pay tax, you get money back. We're earning more after tax than we had before tax. The internal rate of return is still infinite. I now want to do one thing which I find very amusing. Let's compare putting no money in Tom's property versus putting no money in the bank at 6%. In fact, well, because it's so inequitable, let me make it 8% interest. So here we have no money in the bank at 8% interest versus no money in Tom's property growing at only 5%. I think Tom was, it deserves a round of applause. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> you know, there are a number of comments floating around saying, hey, this is Sydney. Where would you find a $99,000 property? Look, do we need to take you by the hand and lead you to it? Uh, yes, you all say. <laughs> then you'll say, this sounds too good to be true. It must be a trick. These deals are real. If you think $99,000 is a good deal, I once bought a property in Queenstown. Who's been to Queenstown just to show you? Look, quite a few. So you know how beautiful it is, right? It was in one of those realtor magazines with lots of color photos and a description. Here they had this little wooden two-bedroom cottage, and the caption read, Help Jed Shift, offers over 20000 considered. And my initial reaction was, this has to be a typographical error. But I made the call anyway, and I said, tell me about it. And the real estate agent said, well, the owner has absconded back to England, owing everyone money. They just want to recover some of their losses. I said, ah, interesting. Tell me. You ask for offers over $20,000. When you ask for offers over X dollars, does anyone ever offer you X plus 5,000 or X plus 10,000? And she thought about it and she said, actually, no. I said, well, in that case, I'll make an offer of $20,000. Now, I did something which I want you to think very carefully about. What I did is I wrote out a check and stapled it to the contract. All right, now, does this change the legality of the offer I was making? Not at all, right? It doesn't change it because if they accepted my offer and I hadn't written that check, would they have had to come to me and say, we need the deposit? Would I have had to pay that deposit? You bet. Conversely, if they don't accept my offer, can they bank the check? No. So it doesn't change the legality of it at all. However, by having a check stapled to the contract, it makes it a very seductive document. No, it does. They think, if we countersign, we can bank that check. It makes it very real. It lets them see that you are serious. So, always staple a check to the contract. I did this. Well, they sent it off to the bank. The bank was in a mortgagee position. You know, they'd taken over. 
And they wrote me a letter. I don't know if they recognized me as the property investor, but they said, Dolph, surely you realize that this property is worth a lot more than 20000 Why don't you come back with a decent offer? And I thought about that for a moment, and I wrote them a letter. And I said, well, you say it's worth more than 20000 but who are you to say so? You're a bank. You're not property investors. You fund other people. In fact, if you really understood it, you'd probably invest. But anyway, I didn't have that much. I said, a real estate agent may be induced to suggest a high price to get a listing or a low price to make a sale. A valuer might suggest a slightly higher price to appease a seller or a slightly lower price to appease a buyer. There is only one price at which everyone can agree on that that property is worth that amount. And that is the one price at which a willing buyer and a willing seller meet. And if you think it's worth a lot more than $20,000, I suggest you find a buyer who agrees with you and sell it to them. In the meantime, to show you that I'm still a serious candidate, I will raise my offer to 22000 Oh, Do you think they accepted it? No way. They wrote back and said, that's ridiculous. However, if you raise to the offer to 22500 it's yours. <laughs> so what do you think they were doing by getting an extra $500? It's called saving face. They didn't want me to go to say, well, I got that property for what I was willing to offer. They wanted to be able to say forevermore, Darus tried to get that property at his price, but we forced him to come up to our price. Was it a problem for me? No. $22,000 and a half. I bought it sight unseen. I phoned my um, tradesman that I used down in Queenstown. I said, hey, I've just bought this property. Check it out, will you? So he phoned back later on that day and said, well, I've had a look. It's not bad. The front door's shot. You'll have to replace that. And the shower cubicle, it's all of that sort of hardwood, it's all rotted away, you'll have to replace it. You should put a fiberglass shower cubicle in there. I said, all right, see to it. Well, as proof that he had integrity, he could have taken me for a ride. Instead, he phoned back five minutes later. He said, have you seen what's in the basement? I said, I didn't even know it had a basement. He said, there's a brand new front door there and a fiberglass shower cubicle. <laughs> Amazing. About three weeks later, I went down to Queenstown. I was seeing my property manager down there. I said, hey, let's check out this new place. So he was showing me through it, and I said, you never told me you had a tenant in it already. He said, I don't. He said, well, to, to whom does all the stuff belong? He said, what stuff? I said, come on, the crockery, the cutlery, the microwave oven, the kitchen chairs, the table, the linen, the closets, the beds, the mattresses, everything. He said, oh, that all came with the house. <laughs> These deals exist, folks. It's been rented out ever since. I don't know what my return is, it's huge. But those deals exist. If you don't think $99,000 deals exist in the greater Sydney area, you won't find them. You won't even go looking for them. When someone gives you one on a silver platter, you'll say, oh, there's something wrong with that one. Do I ever phone for these seemingly incredible deals and I'm told by someone, what, are you an idiot or something? That's a typo. Of course it's not 20,000, or of course it's not 99,000. Do you think that happens? Of course it does. But about once in every 20 attempts like that, I find one that's just a steal. There are many, many deals out there. A lot of people are reluctant to borrow money. They think there's something wrong with getting money from a bank or from anyone else. There's not. There's nothing illegal or immoral about it. Banks make their money that way. They accept depositors' funds, pay them a measly interest rate, and then lend it out in the market at a higher rate. It's just a very legitimate way of doing business. But people get scared having a lot of debt. They get scared because we've been brought up to believe that debt is bad. Don't you dare buy anything until you've got the cash to pay for it. Who's been told that? Sure, lots of us, right? So we think, well, since real estate requires us to borrow a lot of money because I don't have any, and therefore I can't do it because borrowing is bad. Well, as Robert Kiyosaki says, there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. Bad debt is debt on stereos and cars and things that go down in value the moment you buy them. Good debt is debt on assets that go up in value. In fact, I don't sleep well at night when I don't have enough debt. And the reason is as follows. When you owe the bank $5,000, you've got a problem. But when you owe the bank $5 million, they have a problem. <laughs> and they do funny things. They phone you up and say things like, Hey there, how would you like to go out to lunch this week? And you get all excited, you say, yes. But you're a smart cookie. You say, hang on a minute. We went out to lunch last week, and you guys shouted, I suppose you want me to. And you're about to finish the sentence, and they say, of course, it's on us, as usual. 
Why would the banks phone you and take you to lunch when you owe them $5 million? Because they want to give you more money. Why would they want to give you more money instead of someone that only has borrowed 100000 or so? Good investment, good risk. Exactly. Because you always, how frequently? Always pay the interest on time. Why would you do that? So they give you more money. It's a vicious circle. They want confidence in you. When you buy your first property, they might think you're a hot-headed fool who's been to some seminar and you're just doing this on a whim. What will be the flavor next week? You know. But when you've bought one, two, three, when you're on your 10th property, especially when you've got a few mortgages with that particular bank and you've got a history, a track record of always paying on time, they're going to think you're a great risk. They want to give you more money. We've got a whole section we can do on how to apply for a mortgage in such a manner that you're almost guaranteed to get it. And the way you do that, just very briefly, is you create a document. Instead of going to the bank cap in hand saying, please, would you consider me for a loan, maybe? You've got to turn it around. Most people think you get a loan from the bank. Doesn't that put you in a weak position? You're asking them for something. How would you like to offer them something? This is how it goes. You want to buy a piece of real estate but don't have the money. And even if you have the money, you wouldn't use cash to buy it, right? Okay. The banks have all the money and fortunately don't want to buy it. So you go to the bank and say, hey, chums, you've got all this, this cash in the bank. I want to buy a property. I don't have the money or I choose not to use it. Why don't we do a deal? You lend me the money to buy the property and I will give you a pledge that I will faithfully pay interest every time it's due and I will pay back principal on some prescribed basis. So they give you the money, you give them the pledge. That pledge is called a mortgage. All right, so all you need to do is convince them that you're a good risk. You go to them and offer them an investment. And in this proposal for finance that I can talk about in more detail when we have more time, the first sentence is, a mortgage of however much, $99,000, is offered on a property situated at, well, Tom didn't tell us where, but anyway, wherever it's situated. Did you hear what I just said? A mortgage is offered of so many dollars. We're offering the bank a mortgage. All we ask in return is the money. <laughs> but can you see how psychologically, instead of going there cap in hand saying, please consider me for this loan, you are offering them something. In fact, if you're really smart, what you'll do is you'll create 20 or 30 copies of this document and you'll hawk it around all the banks. And you don't need to be surreptitious about it and say, oh, here's your copy and pretend you haven't got any others. I'm bold and upfront about it. Say, well, you've got copy number 13. I've already been to these banks. It's first up best dressed or whoever offers me the best terms, they're the ones I'll go with. And suddenly you'll find that the banks are vying for your business. In fact, banks want to lend you money. If you don't write anything else down tonight, I suggest you write that down. Banks want to lend you money. And then the follow-up sentence is, let them give it to you. Now, always at the end, there are always people who whinge and say, yes, but I don't have any cash, so I can't do it, because banks will only lend me 80% or 90%. Well, there's nothing to stop you traveling around. I remember in the 70s in the Netherlands, banks were offering 125% mortgages. They were offering you more than the purchase price. Was that legal? Of course it was. Everything with real estate, or just about everything is legal. Um, why were they offering more money? They wanted to give you more money. Firstly, the banks were awash with money. They wanted to give you more money so that you could renovate it and, you know, do up the kitchen or the bathroom or perhaps build an extra bedroom. The value of the property would have gone up because of those renovations, so the bank still has collateral to, to cover themselves. They just wanted to give you money. Well, in the States at the moment, you can get 120% finance. Not on every deal, but on many deals. So one thing I'll encourage you to do later on is look further afield than your own backyard. In fact, I would say this to you. If you guys have all of your investment eggs in one basket, the Australian basket, then maybe you should rethink that. The Australian market is but a small percentage of the total worldwide market. Do you want to have all your risk in one country? And it's not being seditious or trying to get you to be traitors to your own country. For heaven's sake, I encourage Americans to invest down here. There's probably more money coming in here than would ever go out. 
I would strongly encourage you to look at all your financing options. So one of the whinging questions I get is where I come from, you won't get a 70 or 80% mortgage. You look around, shop around. And if they don't give it to you, does that stop you from buying it for zero down? Of course not, folks. How else could you buy real estate without putting any cash in yourself? You think it's possible? Of course it is. How would you do it? Use your equity in your own home. That's possible, isn't it? Let's say you've got a home here in Sydney. It's worth half a million. You've got a $300,000 mortgage. Could you borrow another $50,000 against your own home to help buy an investment property? Of course you can. Is mortgage interest on your own home tax deductible? It's not, right? But if you take out an extra 50000 to buy an investment property, is the mortgage interest on that 50000 tax deductible? Sure it is. So you win all, all round. So you can do all of these things. Not only that, it's surprisingly simple. So you can use the equity in your own home. What else could you do to buy a property without using any of your own money? An IOU. From whom? Vendor. Exactly. Ask the seller, are you willing to leave in $60,000? Do you think they're going to laugh at you? Some will. But think of it this way. You've got a, an elderly couple. They've raised five kids. They've got a six-bedroom home. It's too much for them to manage. It's gone up in value enormously. It's now worth $1.2 million. They are downsizing. They're buying a nice little apartment. It's worth only $800,000. That leaves $400,000 cash left over. What are they going to do with that money? So you come along and say, all right, well, I'll buy your, your property. However, I'd like you to leave 300000 in, and I'm willing to pay 6% interest for however many years, five years. They're comparing that with the measly amount of money they'd get by having it in the bank. They're likely to say to you, 300000 are you sure you don't want 400000 Some people relish the thought of still having some ownership of the property they've lived in for 40 years. So ask. If you don't ask, you'll never find out. If you find a deal tomorrow, it's on the market at a million, it's worth three million dollars. You don't have a million, could you buy it? What would you do to buy it? Well, you could try the banks. What if the bank said no? What would you do? Yes, sir. Get some money from a friend. Do you think you'd find friends who'd be willing to go house with you on a deal? You put up the money, you get half the profit. There's two million profit in it. Is that possible? Of course. Again, you're limited by your imagination. And the thing is, I don't want you to just sit there and say, oh, well, that might work, or that's possible. Start dreaming up your own ideas. Run an ad in the paper. Terrific deal found, wanted, equity partner. You might get 20 phone calls, of which three are real contenders to be a partner, because they've got the money. Do you think there are people out there with a lot of money who don't have any business sense as to what to do with it? Of course there are. Again, if you have a track record of looking after them really well, in other words, don't be too mean. Don't try and get it all for yourself. If you make great investments for them, not only are they likely to invest more money with you, they'll refer their friends to you. It's just common sense. Have you ever seen billboards or advertisements on radio television saying, hey, do you want to buy antiques or gold or platinum or baseball cards or maybe fancy furniture? Do you want to invest in all these sorts of things? We will lend you the money to do it. Doesn't happen, does it? But all over the world, banks will lend you money to buy real estate. That tells you two crucial things about real estate. Firstly, it's a very safe and secure investment. And secondly, and most importantly, we come to this point again and again, you don't even need the money to buy it. I can't emphasize that point enough. You are a deal maker. You put things together on paper and you find a way of making it work. How can you make deals work? I came across a funeral parlor. Now, a funeral parlor doesn't sound very interesting. In fact, if I tell you that a funeral parlor has a viewing room and a slumber room and a chilling room, no marks for guessing what they keep cold in there, folks, and a mortuary with channels on the ground to let the fluids flow out. Right? It was empty. It had been empty for three or four years. What would you do with the funeral parlor? Turn it into a restaurant? <laughs> Yuck. So what I did is I got someone to phone every funeral director in the country and say, hey, how would you like to move into the city? And most of them said, you've got to be kidding, and hung up or <laughs> said nothing and hung up. But one of them said, you know what, I've always wanted to move into that city. What's the deal? I said, well, there's this building available, why don't you go and buy it? And why would I offer that, by the way? 
I didn't want a tenant who begrudged the fact that I'd beat him to this property. He said, no, I'm a funeral director. I don't want to be my own landlord. I'd want someone else to own it. I said, right, we can do a deal. He said, how about we sign up a heads of agreement whereby, subject to me buying it, you agree to become my tenant at this amount per year and all that sort of thing. He said, hang on a minute, Sonny Jim, not so fast now. He said, I'll only do it if you give me a long-term lease. <laughs> I said, how long do you want? He said, I'd only consider it if you give me 10 years plus a right of renewal for another 10 years. I said, you know what? We can talk. We can do business. <laughs> so I signed him up on this heads of agreement. I went back to the sellers. The property had gone up for auction, and it failed to reach the reserve price of 195000 So I was in a strong position. I had a tenant willing to pay 30000 a year and a seller who had an empty building that he couldn't find many uses for, and it got passed in at auction. To keep the story short, we ended up doing the deal at $170,000. I went to the bank. Now remember, banks normally lend on the lesser of the purchase price or the valuation. But I was honest and open with the bank and said, I know I'm only paying $170 for this property, but that was then. And between buying it and now, I've got a tenant signed up at $30,000 a year, so send your valuer in. They sent a value around and said, it's got to be worth at least $240,000. we will give you a 67% mortgage, which was $160,000. How much cash did I have in it? Bought it for one seventy, dollars mortgage for one sixty, ten thousand, dollars 10000 right? I had $10,000 tied up. I was pulling out $30,000 a year, about $15,000 going out in mortgage interest. I had $15,000 left over on a $10,000 investment. Isn't that a 150% return? It's a phenomenal return. So again, what creativity can you bring to the deal to increase its value? By the way, I've only ever sold three properties in my life. One of my golden rules in the back of the Real Estate Riches book is sell them, sell. I used to have a rule, never sell, but I thought that's a bit harsh because there are extenuating circumstances. Like when I sold my cottage, I was a real fool then. I didn't realize I should have hung on to it. I was seduced by the $20,000 profit. Oh, and none of you picked me up on the fact that in the beginning I said I'd ask four questions. I only ever got around to asking three. The fourth one goes as follows. You've bought your $100,000 worth of shares for $100,000 cash. It was, bought, it was worth exactly $100,000. You couldn't do anything to increase the value. Let's assume that over time everything's doubled in value. Your shares went from $100,000 to $200,000. What must you do to get some of the benefit of that increase in share value? Sell it. You have to sell, be it a small portion of the portfolio or the whole portfolio. Either way, you have to sell. And in my mind, that is counterintuitive. You've invested in these things to have them grow for your retirement, and then when they have gone up in value, you have to sell and they diminish again. Let's compare that with real estate. You bought that, bought that property for a million dollars. It was worth one and a half million dollars. If it also doubled, it would have gone to three million dollars, right? It's now worth $3 million. What must you do to get some of the benefit of that increase in value? Refinance. You just go back to the bank and say, remember me? Remember, I'm the one that you didn't think it was worth $1.5 million. But I said, that's all right. Even if you base it on a $1 million, just give me my, my mortgage. Well, it's now gone up in value. Your bank-approved valuer has put a value on it of $3 million. Will you lend me some money on it? What will he say to you? Absolutely, because in case you haven't got the message, banks want to lend you money. So you, you still own the property, it's still going up in value, you get the benefit of that increase, even though the banks put up the money. The rental income is still going up in value, you get the benefit of that. Plus, you've got the money that you pulled out. You can use it as a deposit to buy another property or another series of properties. You can just let it grow and grow. So my rule is seldom sell. If you don't have to, hang on to it. People regret some. People think that in order to make your profit, you have to sell. You've bought a property for 100000 it's now worth 200000 Surely you have to sell to get your profit, true or not? No. If it's worth 200000 then that's what it's worth. You've made 100000 profit. A way of looking at it is to imagine that every night at midnight, you sell your entire portfolio of everything, stocks, properties, you name it. So you sell your $200,000 property for $200,000. You have made your $100,000 profit at that stage. Would you agree? And then at one minute past midnight, you buy it back for $200,000. If you wouldn't buy it back for $200,000, then you shouldn't hang on to it in the first place. You should get rid of it. 
So every night you sell your portfolio for what it's worth and buy it back for that same value. You make your profit the day it goes up in value. There's no need to sell. So a final point I want to share on real estate is, imagine you want to be a share market investor, and many of you will be. How do you know which shares, which sector, which companies are going to go up in the future? How do you know that? Or are you guessing? My contention is you never know. You're just guessing. You're gambling and guessing that you know better than the market average which shares are going to do well. And a couple of years ago, word was out that technology shares were going to do well. Buy technology stock. They're going to go up. It's no longer bricks and mortar. It's clicks and whatever rhymed with it. Well, we all know what happened to that, right? The dot-coms became dot-bombs, as it's called, and a lot of people lost out. But no one predicted that, or very few. If it's so easy to know what's going to happen in the, real, in the um, stock market, then surely people would profit from all those trends. So I want to show you my impression of the stock market. The stock market goes something like this. It fluctuates wildly up and down as time goes on. That's the market on average. If you take any one share in isolation, it may fluctuate even more wildly. That's why you get shares that go up by 1,200% in one year or down by 600% the next year. You get shares that go down so far, the company goes bankrupt, right? Does that happen? Of course it happens. By the way, are there any properties that just go bankrupt in that same sense? They're worth nothing? Absolutely nothing. They just fall. Well, it happens a lot. In fact, the share market indices, the S&P 500, is the top 500 shares. It doesn't take into account the hundreds that go bankrupt every year. In New Zealand, it's the NZSC 40, the top 40. Here, it's also 500, right? They're the top shares. Imagine if we looked at the top 500 properties in Australia. How do you think they would perform? So stocks vary very widely. There's a, a standard deviation, if you like, is very high. When you compare that with real estate, real estate tends to fluctuate very gently. And it does go down a little bit sometimes, but generally each peak is higher than the previous peak. Each trough is higher than the previous trough. And when you look at any one property relative to that average, it tends to fluctuate very gently around that. There's not much difference between any one property and the average. Now that is properties in general. I have a question for you. Do you think it would be possible to beat the average in real estate? We've already agreed you can't beat the average with shares. Everyone tries. Mutual fund managers all try, but they, they don't really succeed. So if I could show you a foolproof method of beating the average in real estate, of doing, say, twice as good as average in Australia, would that interest you? Would that be worth something to you? I mean, let me ask this question. Would it be worth $10,000 to you to know how to beat the average with a very high degree of certainty in real estate in Australia? Who would say it would be worth ten grand? Well, thank you. Well, you should see me first before I continue. Who thinks it would be worth 5000 Fewer people. You guys are weird. <laughs> who thinks it would be worth $1,000? Quite a few. So who would like to hear right now for nothing? Okay. Phew, sorry, really. $10,000. Where was I going to get that from? Can I put it on my credit card? Did it? I'm going to tell you, it is so simple when I tell you, say, so, oh, is that all? But I want you to think hard about it because it's not just, it's that all. It's real. Firstly, let's talk about averages. Do you know that in Australia, Half the population is of below average intelligence. <laughs> Some of you are scowling at me saying, even if that's true, why admit it in public sort of thing? Half the population is of below average because the other half is of above average intelligence. That's how an average comes about. You take everyone and average them out, all right? So in any indicator, half is below average, the other half is above average. Does that make sense? Okay. That means that some properties are growing at below average, some are growing at above average. Where would you say there are places where real estate is growing at above the national average? The Gold Coast, right? That's one. Queensland in general. Queensland as a state has a higher growth than the national average. Then there are pockets within Queensland which are growing at way above the state average. That southeastern corner encompassing the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast and even parts of Brisbane has phenomenal growth. Has it been like that just for the last week, or has it been like that for a number of years now? A number of years, right? Are there other parts of Australia growing at above the average? What about parts of Sydney? 
Absolutely. Growing above average. What about parts of Melbourne? Right. Let me take it out somewhere. See, yeah, I hear someone say. Um, imagine you want to invest in America. You haven't really been to America. You don't know about much of what goes on there. But I tell you this fact. Last year, the number one city in the United States for capital growth and population growth was Las Vegas, Nevada. The second one was Phoenix, Arizona. The year before that, the year 2000, numbers one and two were Las Vegas and Phoenix. The year prior to that, 1999, Las Vegas and Phoenix. Before that, Las Vegas and Phoenix. Before that, Las Vegas and Phoenix. 1996, Las Vegas and Phoenix. Would you have some certainty that for this year, it might also be Las Vegas and Phoenix? Would you bet your life on it? No. Would I bet my life on it? No. Would you bet my life on it? <laughs> But if they're not numbers one and two, they're likely to be one and three, or two and three, or three and two, or three and one. They're going to be up there. Of the 3,000 cities in the United States above a certain size, they're likely to be in the top cluster, right? Same in New Zealand. Auckland is not the capital. It has the largest population. It's growing at double the national average. At the other end of the country, you've got Invercargill. Between the last two censuses, there was a population decline of 6%. Invercargill is as close to the Antarctic as you can get without leaving the Western world. A lot of people sell their three-bedroom home in Auckland for $700,000, shift down to Invercargill, buy a bigger, better home for $90,000, put the difference in the bank and spend the interest money on the heating bill. <laughs> However, they don't tend to do well because the values aren't going up very fast. So the first way to beat the average is using what I call geography. Beating the average. Number one, we'll call it geography. Just buy in the right place. Now, if that was all there was to it, that would be pretty exciting. But I'm going to give you another way of beating the average. And I call it the demographics. The baby boomers, the people who were born between 1946 and 1964. They are now starting to reach retirement age. In the United States, someone turns 50 every 17 seconds. That means in Australia, it'll be about every four or five minutes. There's going to be a hugely increasing need for retirement homes, rest homes, assisted living facilities, golf courses, all those things. If you can cater for that sector that's growing in size, you will beat the national average again because there's a growing demand for that. Makes sense, right? There's a third way. And that is, I simply call it by the seaside. When we were all kids and we had holidays, where did we all tend to go? Well, we went to the seaside. This works all over the world. In France, where are the holiday resort places? On the Côte d'Azur, on the Mediterranean coast. Same for the Greek islands, anywhere you can think of. In England, New, uh, Brighton, not New Brighton. Brighton was by the seaside. Same here in Australia. So before, we used to live in cities because we had to live where the work was. But as we get more telecommuting, and as this burgeoning mass of retiring people can live anywhere, more and more people want to live by the sea. So if you buy by the sea, it will have a growth rate of higher than the national average. That's because dinky little towns inland where steel mills that have gone into decline and all that sort of thing are located, they have a declining value. So any one of these in themselves can give you a greater than average growth rate. Imagine if you compound them. Imagine if you had one that met all three criteria. I lived in La Jolla for a while. La Jolla is a very ritzy suburb near San Diego. And for those of you who may have been there, there's a seal colony on the beach. As you leave the seal colony and cross the road, you come to a retirement home. This retirement home caters to the right demographics. Geographically, it's in La Jolla, one of the best suburbs in the United States, and it's by the sea. Do you think that that retirement home may have a growth rate higher than the average in the States? It's easy, folks. Same applies here in Sydney. If you've got a house with a view of the sea, it's worth more than one that doesn't have it. If it's got access to the sea, is it worth more? Right. These things sound so simple that when you say them, you think you're kidding yourself. So there are many aspects like that that we can cover where we talk about things you can do to increase your chances of making a lot of money. We spoke of depreciation, and I said I'd come back to that. I want to highlight one other thing. People get confused about depreciation. They think, well... As soon as the government finds out that there's this loophole, they're going to close it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Imagine we have a computer. Do computers go up in value or down, by the way? Down. So let's start with a computer that you buy for, say, $10,000.
you pay $10,000 for it. Over time, its value goes down to $6,000. Is that reasonable? Yeah, that's about three weeks we're talking about now. <laughs> they never go up anyway. Now, the government, in its wisdom, allows you to depreciate that computer. Why do they do that? They want Australia to be competitive with the rest of the world, so they say, well, since you've spent that money on it, we'll allow a deduction for its probable decline in value, its depreciation. Now, how does it work? Imagine that you end up selling the computer, but you only get $5,000 for it. That means they'll allow you to depreciate another $1,000 because it, you sold it for less than the book value. Conversely, if you manage to get $7,000 for it, then you have to pay what's called depreciation recovered tax because you claimed it as if it was worth $6,000, but it was actually worth $7,000. So far, so good, right? Well, let's compare that with a piece of real estate. We're now going to talk about a house. And let's say you buy it for $100,000. And in Australia, we're going to have to add, let's assume it's new, because when you do, um, buy a second-hand property, you get a written-down book value. So here's a new house, and you depreciate it down to $60,000. Same thing applies. If you sell it and you can only get $50,000 for it, then you could claim another $10,000 depreciation. On the other hand, if you sell it and get $70,000 for it, then you have to pay depreciation recovered tax. But there are two important differences that I want to highlight between the computer and the house. Firstly, in the case of the computer, did you pay $10,000 for it? Yes, you have to pay for the computer. And secondly, did it or did it not go down in value? It went down. When it comes to real estate, so the purchase price was $100,000, did you pay $100,000 for it? What if you only paid $10,000 for it? Can you only depreciate 10% of it because you've only got 10% cash in there? No, you can depreciate the whole thing. Even if you put zero money down in it, you just signed a contract to get it. 100% financed. Can you still depreciate it? Yes, you claim that depreciation money. You get that benefit from the government. Now, did it go down in value? No, it's gone up in value. In all probability, it's gone up through the roof. Might be worth two or three hundred thousand dollars now. Even though it goes up in value, you can still claim the depreciation. Right? And you only have to repay it, depreciation recover tax, if you're silly enough to sell. If you never sell, you never have to pay it. It's another compelling reason not to sell. So a lot of this takes time to sink in. I know I can spend a lot of time giving you the facts and figures of how real estate works, and my fear is that you still wouldn't do it. You would walk away thinking, well, that made sense, but you won't do it. So I need to get into your core thinking. I need to share a story with you about what happened to a girlfriend of mine. Um, I had a girlfriend and her birthday came up. And I thought, well, let me treat her on her birthday. So on the, the day when it finally arrived, I said, I've hidden your present somewhere in the house. And she got all excited about it and went out looking for it until she found it. And she came to me and thanked me profusely and we proceeded to have breakfast. And then after breakfast, I said, you know what? I said there was one hidden, but there are actually three hidden in the house in total. You've only found the first one. So you can imagine, she got all excited again and went out looking for the other two gifts. And she kept on looking till she found them. And when she found them, she came to me and thanked me profusely. And then later on in the day, I said, you know what? I said there were three, but there were actually ten. And she said, you're kidding me. I said, I'm serious. So she got all excited, and out she went looking for each present. She kept on looking and looking. And as she looked longer and longer, the remaining presents became harder and harder to find. Of course, when I hid them, I didn't know which ones would be easy or which ones would be difficult. But she persevered until she'd found all ten. Now, did she have reason to believe that there may have been more presents? She might have had, but she didn't look for any more. And the reason I'm telling you this story is for the following point that I want to make. When you know there is one deal out there, one present, you will look for it. And then you'll stop looking. When you know there are a total of three, you will look for them, but then you'll stop looking. When you know there are ten, you will look for them, but then you stop looking. And the problem that you guys face is you don't know how many good deals there are out there. Unless I go out tomorrow and figure out how many good deals there are and phone you each individual and say, well, there are exactly 28 and a half great deals out there in Sydney. I mean, you'd look then, right? You'd want to find them. But you don't know how many there are, so the temptation is not to look. 
and sometimes you just don't know when you're sitting on a gold mine. In fact, sometimes you're sitting on a gold mine and you don't know it. In fact, one of you is. Taped underneath one of your seats is a $50 bill, but before you look, here are the rules. The person who gets the money won't be the one whose seat it's under necessarily. It'll be the person who finds it. So I want you to find that money, and when you do find it, sing out and let me know you've got it. Has anyone found it? You got it. Oh, congratulations. Big cheer. Let's give them a round of applause. Could you stand up for a moment, please? Now, tell me, why didn't you look under your seat earlier? It's been there all evening. You had no reason to believe it's there. Well, thank you very much. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Is Shalom in the room, please? Shalom, could you step down? And I think you know where you might have to go. Because the thing that really amuses me is I told the story about my girlfriend. I said, when you know there's one, you will look for one. And when you know there are more, you will look for more. So Shalom, would you mind going into where you need to go? And when you retrieve it, could you hand it over to Shalom, please? <laughs> Shalom, that is yours. Shalom always puts the money away for me. And the point I want to make, I want you to think hard about this. As I just told the story, I used to tell the story about the girlfriend and the ten gifts at the beginning of a weekend event, and then at the end of the weekend, I'd do this exercise to say there's money under the chairs, and as soon as the first person finds their note, everyone else stops looking, because you're deluding yourselves into thinking that there's only one. And as time went on, I could sandwich those two together. Now I do them back to back. I tell the story about the girlfriend, I say, in fact, one of you might be sitting on a gold mine. One of you is. Underneath a chair, there is the money. As soon as someone shouted, oh, I got it, the rest of you stopped looking. There are five more $50 notes hidden under those seats. <laughs> I want you to think hard about this, because you see, the way we react to these exercises in a classroom-style situation, they are exactly the way that you react in real life. If you're not happy with your financial circumstances, ask yourself, could it be because of the way you're reacting to these sorts of things? Someone tells you there's a great deal out there in Sydney. You're in one of the hot spots in Australia. There's more growth here than just about any other place you can think of. What is stopping you from going out to look at these things? Make a bit of money for yourself. They say it's better to give than to receive. Well, that's true. But if you're going to give, you might as well give a lot. <laughs> And to give a lot, you need to have a lot. Right? Money can't buy you happiness. That's true. But hey, I'd rather cry in a Rolls Royce than in a Mini. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're going to be unhappy anyway, you might as well be rich and unhappy rather than poor and unhappy. Money can't buy you happiness, but hey, it buys the next best thing. <laughs> you know, for every argument you can come up with to say it's better to be pious and poverty-stricken, there is a count of you. Your poverty will help no one. Your wealth can help many, many people. Perhaps your mission in life is to figure out how you might help more people. I get asked to speak in a lot of places. I get asked to speak on cruise boats, which is a real pain, because I might get to speak for half a day, but the whole cruise lasts a week. I mean. But anyway, I was on one of these cruises going up to Alaska, and this woman came to me and asked me to read her diary. Now, I don't know how you guys think about it, but when someone asks you to do that, I think, you know, it's a bit... Tenuous. So I said, no, I really wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. She said, no, I insist. So with a lot of reluctance, I took her diary and read the first entry. And on Monday, the entry read, Dear Diary, tonight the captain invited me to dine at the captain's table for dinner. It was such an honor that I was thoroughly flustered. And I turned the page. And there on Tuesday was the entry, Dear Diary, tonight the captain invited me back to the captain's cabin for after-dinner drinks. It was really exciting. And then on Wednesday, I turned the page, and there was the entry, Dear Diary, Tonight, the captain made suggestions unbecoming of an officer or a gentleman. And I turned the page, and there on Thursday was the entry, Dear Diary, Tonight, the captain threatened that unless I succumb to his advances, he shall sink the entire ship. 
and I turned the page, and there on Friday was the entry, Dear Diary, today I saved the lives of 1,500 passengers. <laughs> And it's just a story, but the point is this. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. For me, that means going out to buy a piece of real estate. If you do nothing else from tonight, buy a piece of property. You'll curse me in 10 years' time, only because I didn't tell you to buy two. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.